Progressively, I will, I will get copies of virtual machines to, to pass to you. I'll give you a, a USB stick with a, the image of a virtual machine. And I'd like you, if possible, for you to make a copy on your own computer. And I'll give you an extra USB stick to an empty one. And like that, we will exponentially cover everybody in the room. I have here a map of more or less at what level this hands-on session will take place. So probably you've heard Bart Pranel uh, about the mathematics of crypto, and you've heard other speakers about the network protocols and perhaps libraries that are used. And I would like to focus on what a developer uh, should know about uh, having TLS <coughs> installed on a system. And I've structured my talk as a story, starting from a website that's accessible only through HTTP. And we're going to try together to make it work, really work, with all the difficult details, with HTTPS. Now, because, <coughs> because it's a didactic session, I did not focus on portability or user friendliness or accessibility. And not even all security aspects are covered. In fact, SSL TLS is quite a hairy subject, and it changes from month to month, almost, in what the recommended best practices are. Uh, so much so that it's a great subject for DevOps. And there's been a talk at the OWASP conference, EU, uh, UPSEC EU, this last summer, where uh, Yo presented uh, a, a version of this talk, which was turned into, into DevOps. In the first stage, we're going to go from not having any security on the site to being able to access the main page through HTTPS without errors. Without errors, and already that, you will see, is a big deal. Then after that, in the second part, we will configure. So once we have the ability to do the padlock, you can still do things wrongly with SSL, TLS. So we're going to look at two of the ways which should be avoided and how to do that. And in Act 3, in the third part, I will show you in an, in an application that, in a website that is initially accessible through HTTP, how, what it takes and how many things you need to pay attention to when migrating it to be working properly under TLS 2. I'm using on the virtual machine a Fedora distribution of Linux, version 20. It's new. And I've configured the virtual machine to uh, have the host name learn.tls.now uh, so that I don't have any clashes with real websites on the internet in case you run it and it's plugged into the network. You will not need network connectivity, except perhaps if you want to install additional packages. Um, and the user I created on it is secapdev with a password secret. It's the same combination for the web application which has a login form. And the reason we will use the command line is that I'd like you rather to understand the process and the concepts than what a particular GUI can do be, uh, for you without showing you what's going on behind the scenes. So if you know these things, you are likely to be able to apply them on Mac, on Sigwin, on Linux versions, on Unix. And also, if you learn how to do them on the command line, then if you need to connect to a, a remote server to get this working, you're very likely to be able to do it with a simple SSH. And we will edit configuration files for the same principles. I have already installed in the virtual machine the Apache web server. Those would be the commands to install it and enable it if it was not already installed. So you can reproduce it by yourself on a, on a completely clean system. And for your information, the pages that belong to the web application are in var www.html. The configuration directory is etc, or I mean slash etc slash httpd. And, and also, in order to not necessitate network connection, I've installed the SSL module inside Apache. But I've, uh, I've inactivated the configuration file. So in the beginning, the virtual machine will behave as if mod SSL is not installed at all. And then at a certain step, we'll enable the configuration file, reload the server, and then it will, it's not that it will work, but it will give you the errors that an unconfigured fresh deployment of SSL 
has on most operating systems. I forgot to mention here that I'm using for, for space um, reasons the convention that uh, a dollar prompt are commands that you can execute with your user without elevating privileges. <coughs> and with a hash in front, with a hash prompt, those would be commands that you should execute with sudo in front. I will consider that act one is complete when we've managed to successfully access our website, both through HTTP and through HTTPS. OK, let's go to HTTP Learn TLS now. Your Firefox instance on the virtual machine is configured to go directly there. <coughs> it seems, though, that at the moment I saved the, uh, the virtual machine, the web server was maybe not running. This is the command for launching it. I've also let Firefox remember the password, the username and password, because that's not going to be the important part of, of the session today, knowing what the password is. The important thing will be to find it in traffic captures, for example. And I suggest you log in like that. Notice that the, the first page you get onto is green. And then from then on, there's another link where you go to another page with some lorem ipsum. What will be interesting, though, to see, <coughs> and how it's not uh, secure, will be to start Wireshark. Wireshark is this icon with the blue, the blue shark fin. And if you launch it, it will be ready to start capturing traffic, which you do by clicking on this field. Here would be capture options. This is where you would enter it. OK, now I've shrunk the Firefox window. I'm going to reload this page. And we're going to see what it looks like in Wireshark. Oh, for the keyboard. I think a logout might solve it, but if not, a reboot. We would? No, it works. D directly? It just without any logo. Super. For using Wireshark, <coughs> it's a bit complicated to try to follow a protocol that's happening in this window. But what you can do is pick a representative packet from the conversation, for example, the one in which the page is requested. requested. You right click and you go down to follow TCP stream. And if anyone knows how, to, how you can turn this into a button on the toolbar, I'd be thankful for that to find it out myself. Otherwise, we'll keep doing right click, scroll down, follow TCP stream. And what you get if you do that is a, a nicely colorized log of the traffic. So you get first a request on a, with a red tint, and then the response. And this indeed is the the source code of the HTML page, which contains the form. I'm going to log on now. I'm going to log on now with the username and password, and then we're going. I'm going to return to Wireshark to find to show the the password. If the managers needed any convincing by this point with Wireshark, you have convinced them that they definitely have to get one of those padlock thingies on the website to protect and make it secure against everything. Right. So we're, we're ready in that case to see how to deploy one of those. Maybe, maybe it just works out of the box, no? You, you have to type HTTPS, I think, and that's it then. So if you just type HTTPS there, ah, something happens, but it's because... So it, without you doing anything, you get some kind of response about the connection being untrusted. In fact, I've skipped a, se a step where the, um, where the SSL module was not even running, so the server was not even speaking HTTPS with anyone. That one is, is skipped in the, um, in the demonstration. It's like this. You would get an unable to connect 
if you have not installed and activated the SSL module of Apache. But for going on from, <coughs> okay, we've done that. Um, in order to get HTTPS to work well, we need to get a connection, we need to access it without any connection error. And for that one, there's a step here which is also already baked into the virtual machine. Um, normally when you install the module freshly onto an Apache that didn't have SSL modules installed, you would also have to tell Apache to, uh, to restart itself. If you just change the configuration, that it's enough to tell Apache to reload itself. And at this point, this is where we are with the virtual machine. So there is something working there, but it says the connection is untrusted and we get the browser complaining about us. In this window, the user has the ability to continue though. The user just needs to do this one and then click here and follow a few more steps. And the user would be able to go further. But would that be a problem? Well, if the user continued, they would have an SSL session which would protect the confidentiality of that traffic and the integrity, but what it would not provide is authenticity of who the other side is, who the server is. So it's, pos it's perfectly possible Firefox will eventually let you continue even under those circumstances, but there's no guarantee about who you're talking to. If your production site is like this, you're with errors like this, then you're letting you, your users get used with bad security habits, and the, unfortunately that affects also sites which make, which put an effort into security. Because this is exactly the kind of uh, warning a user would get if an attacker was in the middle between the user and the legitimate site with, with its SSL perfectly in order, and it's just that the attacker is in the middle controlling the traffic, if the attacker puts its own, his or her own uh, proxy site up, since they don't have the certificate which corresponds to the site, there would be this kind of error. And so if you're training your users on your site to say, oh, this is nothing, I can just click through, you are teaching them that it's okay to do this and they'll do it when there's an attacker too. So let's dissect a little bit that warning. Firefox says at the top, this connection is untrusted. And it gives us details that Learn TLS now uses an invalid security certificate and that the certificate is not trusted <clears throat> because it is self-signed. Let's see why each of those happens. First of all, security certificate, we didn't do anything. I didn't do it on the virtual machine. You didn't do it just now. So what happened? Fedora did. When I installed the SSL module of Apache, it helpfully generated a dummy certificate just to help novice users get up and running quicker with, with trying out sites with HTTPS. And the principle there is that if, there's an, if it's a novice user who, who runs it, they will probably not be interested in getting the SSL right, but in making the website. So like this, <coughs> they're allowed to, to get a taste of the technology without having to jump through too many hurdles. And if it's a professional who installed the module, well, a professional is supposed to have a process to deploy proper certificates anyway, so they will just overwrite these dummy ones. So it's a sort of compromise of the site being by default less secure, but more accessible to newcomers and without big drawbacks for professionals. And most Linux distributions do it this way. Now you might be curious, where is this certificate? How do we find it? We'll, we'll look at the configuration file which indicates where we can find it, but perhaps first let's, let me talk about why Firefox says that the certificate is not trusted. The reason it gives is because it is self-signed. I find that this is a bit of a misnomer. That's not, the fact that the certificate is self-signed is not a problem because in the end the root CA certificates that you have in the browser are self-signed and yet they are the root of trust. So the problem is not the self-signing. The problem is that the, the ultimate person who's signing something isn't in a set of known and trusted entities. So the certificate signer is not trusted. That's what it should be. Um, OK, I, uh, we can go to this in the break if you're curious, but I will not uh, belabor the point here. 
Now, for continuing, the browser will ask you. No, when the browser displays that warning and gives the user the opportunity to continue, the browser is in essence saying, "I don't trust this certificate. Do you trust it? If yes, continue." But what the user sees when the warning pops up, and the user just answers yes, the user is actually answering the question, "Do you want me to get out of your way so you can do what you came here to do with the site?" So there's a mismatch there in understanding, which makes that many people, I suppose, click through. And that's why a browser made it more and more difficult and more and more uh, barriers to getting over this process on autopilot. There's a, an add exception permanently option in that form where you can go through. And if you happen to click on that, when you're accepting the certificate of the man in the middle, of the attacker in the middle, where you've just made the risk permanent by adding the exception permanently. Best is to avoid exposing your users to this in the first place and, and keep it so that when they do get the warning, it is something different. It is something out of the usual for them. Don't let clicking through warnings become business as usual. Okay, so far, how are we doing on progress? We haven't been able to uh, access the SSL site without problems because we still have that trust warning. Let's go to the question of where the certificate is. Um, you were supposed to meet SSL.conf when, when I was going to, to reactivate the configuration file and thereby re-enable the module. But if you, just, if you just want to go to that file on the command line and edit it, we can look at the directives that make up the, that indicate where the keys are. And I'm going to show it, <coughs> I'm going to show you on my um, virtual machine too. A command for displaying that you could use is less, L-E-S-S. -S. This is the command. Yes. Which is the command to change the KBD? Set KBD map space BE. Okay, okay, I'll do it. We'll do it like this. Thank you. <laughs> so this is one Okay, guys, these are the commands. And I'm going to also run one to show you the, the configuration file and where the keys are.
you have to scroll a while down down the screen but here we get them this directive tells Apache from where to take the certificate file and a little bit lower is the directive that tells Apache where to take the private key that corresponds to that certificate. For a little bit later, you will see some commented directives here. That's for making it easy to edit the file. Yes, Ken? How do you recommend the uh, private key be stored? On, in a hardware security module, ideally, but, <laughs> but on realistic production servers, it can... There are two ways to protect it that I'm discussing when we generate the key pair. One of them would be to protect it at generation, to encapsulate it, for example, encrypt it via AES, and have a passphrase on it. The disadvantage of that one is that whenever the, the server needs to load it, somebody needs to enter the password. Another way to protect it is to just use operating system protections and put it in a directory where only the web server and maybe the admins have access and to do that with standard Unix uh, file permissions, and on top of that with SE Linux permissions or, or access control, if you can do it. For the purpose of this virtual machine, I have disabled SE Linux. It, wa <laughs> it, it kept forcing some permissions uh, back to a state where it would have made it more awkward for us to edit the pages of the website. Shall we, shall we look a little bit at those certificates and see, maybe we can see with our own eyes what was wrong. What Firefox says, sorry, what Firefox says here at technical details as a reason is the self-signedness and there's also another problem which should be apparent from here view certificate but which I don't see apparent so to go to this file and analyze it we'll use the um, magic open SSL command the the SSL protocol and associated crypto functionalities are implemented in a library which has several kinds of front ends. And one of the front ends they've built for it is command line. In my impression, the aesthetics of it, it was a little bit hodgepodge. They, they, were trying to, um, they were trying to put a command line interface on top of a very rich and expressive API of C functions in essence and they have so many options and so many possibilities that I think whoever made the command line interfaces decided to simplify things and to make some choices for you and as a consequence you have some subcommands of OpenSSL that have inconsistent ways of calling the same concept. It's a little bit weird and not greatly documented but all the commands that we need are in the presentation. They might have typos but they are in the presentation. So with the OpenSSL command, it's used just to launch subcommands, and those subcommands have options. And those options are either introduced with a single minus, minus and then the option name, for like this one, no out. Sorry. Or they have one parameter separated by space from a parameter with minus and an option name. Now let's look at the let's look at the certificate of the web server. Let's see. That's the one. Yeah, that's the one. <coughs> Is, is any one of you really unfamiliar with uh, Unix and Linux? 
Does anybody have difficulties reading this, or will anybody have difficulties reading this at home and not really knowing how to reproduce it? Sounds like we're doing quite well. Okay, so you will know that, that these two commands and this one command that I'm executing are equivalent. I'm even going to do it like this. Hello. Ah, uh, what's missing is this. There we go. So this is what the default certificate installed by Mod SSL looks like. And the no, this is not the default one, it seems. So this seems to be one run by me. The problems with with this certificate are several fold. Its key is quite short. It's issued by someone yeah? Nine, yes. Yes. Yeah, so when you have the hash in front of the commands, you should do sudo before. Yes, yeah. You should have a slash in front of the etc. Yeah. Yeah. So F Firefox is complaining about a bunch of problems, among which one is that the issuer in the certificate is not somebody Firefox knows. This is self-signed and you can inspect like that the details of this and, and you can run this command. You can run this command on certificates that you download from uh, commercial sites. Look at Amazon's certificate like this. Look at Google's. You know, you'll, you'll see what kind of parameters they use. You'll see what's used in the field. Maybe it will inspire you in what settings you'll use for your website. So, with the, with the original, with a defaultly generated uh, certificate, this is, the set, this is the set of things that will work and the set of things that will not work. Um, by default, it's not at least 2048 bits. The public exponent is not at least 17 bits. There's going to be a mismatch because the default certificate will be created for localhost.local .local domain, not learn.tls now. And what is also not going to work is that the certificate is not signed by anyone that the browser trusts. So let's, let's solve these things a few at a time. We need to generate a new certificate. And for that, we need a fresh key pair with the right parameters for strength, which values you probably picked up during the training, dur during the course this week. Or if not, by Friday, you will surely have the guidance on these. With the key pair, you keep the private key private, don't tell it to anybody, but you need to advertise the public key to the world and make sure the world knows that that public key corresponds to your website, to the domain name. And in, in practice, that's most often done by registering your website and the public key with the registration authority, which checks that indeed you, you own the key and you own the website. And then the material will go to a certification authority or certificate authority, very often in the same entity as the registration authority, who will use their uh, private key to create a certificate which, uh, which reassures anybody who trusts that CA that indeed <coughs> for the website Learn TLS Now, that is the public key that, uh, that the visitor should expect. We're going to stick with OpenSSL, even though there are 
numerous tools, a couple available in Fedora, Java has its own key tool which can do this, OpenSSL has a, a constellation of scripts around it, at, all at different levels of granularity. Uh, but we're going to take the command line route which will teach us the most. For generating a key pair, by default I think it's DSA, but the process for generating a key pair for the RSA algorithm is simpler, so we'll do that. Uh, by default, OpenSSL will generate the certificates in a format that's accepted by Apache as is. The format is, has the acronym PEM and it stands for Privacy Encrypted Mail, I think. Um, the conventional extension for key files, for key pair files is .key. We're going to choose at least 2048 bits because according to NIST guidance, National Institute for Standards and Technology, they have, in one of their pub publications listed there, they have a um, calendar saying by when you should switch to which minimum length of uh, key. And the um, Certification Authority Browser Forum has baseline requirements which recommend the same thing. Everybody should switch to 2048. For the public exponent, by default is generated with the public exponent 3. Really convenient for the browser, which may be on a mobile phone or, or a watch or a washing machine. Um, it's really easy to exponentiate to the third power. <coughs> but in 2006, Bleichenbacher found an attack against uh, that exponent in the PKCS number one standard, the version that's also in use now. And so there's more suspicion now about public exponents that are small. And in two years ago already, Bart Pernell was recommending to use more than, or at least 32 bits for the public key exponent. So we're going to generate our key pair with one of those exponents that, that satisfy Bart's recommendation. And that's the command you would need to do, you would need to launch for uh, the generation of such a key pair. You can copy-paste from outside your virtual machine to inside the virtual machine. Um, I think control insert is going to copy text to the shared clipboard between the VM and your host operating system, and shift insert will paste that text. Control insert and shift insert. You can interrupt me at any time if you find if you see something that's not clear or confusing or you don't need the reason for it. <coughs> These commands should still be executed after that CD change directory to slash etc slash pki slash tls.
if it, I think I'm going to accelerate a little bit the pace so we get to see some of the web uh, website stuff too. Tell me if, it, if I go too fast and we'll, we'll do it like that. If I go too fast or if, if you're not managing to keep up, then raise your hand and I'll come and help you out. Here's Ken, the protection if you don't have a hardware security module. Do you know of additional ones? <coughs> and, and more downtime if something blows up the server. Yep. But I think even in that case, they should invest in a technology like this um, SSL passphrase dialogue. So it's possible to tell the SSL module that when it needs a passphrase for, the, um, for, for unwrapping the private key, that it should go talk to a certain process or to a port or to a pipe. So there are ways to delegate obtaining the password and that could come through the network. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, the SSL module could let the process know that it needs it and then maybe that module somehow notifies somebody remotely and establishes a secure tunnel of that kind. Yep. And through that comes then the password from, from the center. I think there are ways to do it. So far with the key pair generation, we have checked the first two boxes from there, but we, we would still get the warning and we still haven't told Apache that it can use the new key pair. So for that one, we're going to simulate what happens in reality. We're not going to generate a self-signed certificate. We're going to generate a certificate signing request where you prepare something to give to the certification authority together with your photo ID or whatever else they need to make it possible for them to authenticate that it's your key and it's your website. The general form is that you use the REQ subcommand of OpenSSL. You should not use the minus X509 options, otherwise you get a self-signed certificate, not a certificate signing request. You take the keys, the private slash keys dot key file that you've just generated, and the output would be a file that I've called certrec.csr. .csr is the conventional, um, conventional ex extension. Among these criteria here, the bottom one was that it should be valid for one year, not just 30 days, which is what the default installation of OpenSSL does. So you want to do that. One of those options needs to be days minus days 365. The default hash algorithm is fine. It's SHA-1. It's not MD5. Uh, about f five or six years ago, an international team using in, uh, even a, a PS3 farm in Switzerland managed to forge a certificate and have, they had a, a harmless certificate signed <coughs> by a certificate authority who still used MD5 and because they managed to generate collisions for that MD5 between a harmless certificate and a super powerful certificate, the moment the CA created a certificate for their harmless certificate, for their, yes, yes. The moment the, the CA authenticated the harmless certificate, that signature was also good for the powerful certificate. So these researchers were then able to issue completely fake, but completely accepted uh, SSL certificates for whoever they wanted, Google, Microsoft, CNN, big sites, anyone. There are also constraints that I've put there whose solution is not available as a command line option, but where we, w we would have to edit a configuration file to get it going. But I think I'm going to go, oh, I'm not going to ask you to look at that. It's already preloaded with the values that need to be there. I'm going to list it here on my screen and we're just taking a look at it and we're going to advance That's the configuration file. <coughs> it's got hashes are comments. It's got something that you recognize as sections, like this one, for example, here introduces a new section. And there's a way to give, to say on the command line, I want to use this configuration file and I want to use this section from the configuration file. 
And that, that way you're able to set some values that have no equivalent on the command line. And we need that for, the, um, for later on in the certificate signing request and for the certification for signing it. So the interesting one we want to look at is V3. <coughs> Here we go. So this is, a, this is a section where I found useful stuff um, being used. By default, OpenSSL seems to want to create certificates of a CA. So in a certificate, you, have, you can have fields that describe what the purpose of that certificate is and where you can limit it. This certificate is going to be for code signing, but not email signing. Or this certificate is going to be for signing other certificates. I'm a CA. Or on the contrary, I'm not going to sign your certificate which says you are a, a CA. You're not a CA. I'm going to sign it for you if you're asking me, if you're asking me for a website certificate. So these fields here, um, key usage, non-repudiation, digital signature, and key encipherment, they're good for a website certificate. I also have the last row there, which is used for the following problem. Here we go. What, dom what domain name and where do we put it? We want to have that common name to be this, the site's name. But what if I'm making my server available under different host names? For example, not only learn.tls.now, but also www.tls.now. Maybe between those two, you could generate a certificate for star.tls.now. But what if I also want to make it available as just pure tls.now? The wildcard would not function for that. So also, you might imagine that it's possible to have different things listening on that machine and somehow figuring out what for which host the, um, the browser wants the certificate and to give him a, a special certificate for that host. But it doesn't work like that because the SSL connection is established before the browser says, by the way, I'm, I'm talking to you because I want to talk to www, not learn.tls.now. So you need the certificate before you can know what host it's for. There's this paradox in it. The way around it was to offer this. There's a subject alt names option. There's a field in the certificate where you can list other DNS names that you want that certificate to be valid for too. And in fact, if you, if you add alternative names, then you have to add the main name there too. And it's this bottom line here that you can already see implemented. I've done it here in the configuration file. So when we generate our certificate signing request, and then later when we have a simulated CA signing it, it will use these things, and these will appear in the certificate. So we can move on quicker. On one line. It's one field. It's, a, it's this string that will appear. Let's see, what, what other problems? OK, so this would be the, um, the synthesis of all those options. The lifetimes, the domain names, the multiple domain names, uh, not to make it a CA certificate, but a website, website certificate, and to I don't know, Th those are all. I'm going to run this command, or you could try to run it too. <coughs> then you will see on your own computers the warning disappearing. Yes, I, I urge you to run this command too. Don't forget the sudo. I won't blame you after understanding everything here with the command line. You will run to one of the GUIs that automate this thing. No, not any problem with me. Or a puppet script, yeah.
Did I forget the parameter? Here we go. This is the certificate signing request that we have created. You can see here the, com the distinguished name of our website. We can see that the, the public key, well, the, the key length is 2048-bit. And the exponent has four <laughs> bytes, the 32 bits, and another bit, so 33 bits. You see that we're not using for the signature MD5, but it seems the, the extra fields for the certificate are going to be used only at CA time. Are there a few who, who have generated the certificate request? Let's see if we have five, I'll go on. Okay. <clears throat> How do you bootstrap trust between strangers? It's all fine for me to give one of you my key and then we could together check the fingerprint or something like that and then you can trust it directly, it, the individual key. It's another thing to try to do that at a scale of millions of purchases per year or month or maybe even day with um, users who have never met the business in, in person. The solution was to delegate the checking and to delegate also the trust establishment. And there's money to be made in the, <coughs> in the business of um, certification authorities. You can be the second man, in, uh, the second person to be a space tourist if you're running one of those and you can go on to found uh, the Ubuntu Foundation if you've worked in this kind of business. And um, the, Id the idea is that um, Browser makers will try to vet certificate authorities and decide which ones of the CAs have the best practices of checking things and are the least corruptible, hopefully. And they will then <coughs> install the, the certificates of those CAs into a database in the browser, which will seed, which, which will make it so that when you install a browser, there's already a number of entities all over the world that you would trust to introduce other websites to you. And then you can add manually a few more uh, for yourself too. I have created a dummy CA with which to simulate uh, the CA's procedure. And I've entered it into among the trusted certificates in your, in your Firefox. And we can go and take a look at it. So in Firefox, you need to go edit preferences. And in the advanced tab, you'll see a view certificates. I'm going to stack these like this so you can see at the same time where we were. And here, yo, you will be happy to know that there's a secup dev, a, C a secup dev CA, yes. It's valid for five years, <laughs> but only in the virtual machine. And in, in this certificate, I don't have, in this certificate, I don't need to have a, a host name or anything because it's not a website certificate. 
I need to have a name of, that describes a, a company or an organization that does it. And you can do, you can do your own self-signed CA certificates and import them into Firefox or import them into the test browsers in your test or validation environment. No, it's test or acceptance environment. And then you can continuously generate your own internal certificates without having to change the root certificate in those testing browsers for a long time. When I got my fingers dirty with this, it was because I was trying to understand what my operating system does to secure my, um, my uh, SSL connection to my own local web server. And I didn't understand why every time I reinstalled it, I kept having to, to go through this except, add exception stuff. And as I was digging, I realized that not only one certificate was being generated every time you installed the module, but two certificates, a CA, key pair and certificate, and a, a website certificate. And every time both were getting regenerated. So even if I took the CA certificate and, uh, and imported it in my browser and said, okay, I trust you, next time when I was running the script that came with the web server for refreshing the, the site certificate, it was ruining everything because it was, it was changing the CA cer certificate too. So that's when I decided I'm gonna have my own script which keeps the CA certificate long term and I can install it on, on locally on my browser and on friends' browsers and so on, anybody who needed it. And uh, then I could change the key whenever I felt like it. I just needed to have it signed again by the same CA and it would just work without any warning. And our goal is to have our key signed by this CA and appear in the browser and not give this, this <coughs> warning anymore. So I don't want to do an add exception, I want this to just disappear. At some point in practice, it, it was noticed that there was no standard for how strongly do you verify that somebody who's asking for a certificate and presents you a domain name and a key, how much are they really the right person to own that certificate? And it was discovered that some CAs with more lax practices were able, were able to issue to attackers certificates that the attackers shouldn't have received. But since it was so largely deployed, you couldn't start suddenly just um, ignoring all the certificates which were created according to the practice that was okay enough up to that point. So they decided to, uh, to solve this problem by creating a new category of certificate, the so-called extended validation certificates, where it's not enough anymore to send an email and, and uh, receive the certificate at that email address. For these, you have to go with a uh, photo ID and with papers that show who can take decisions for a company and to show that a company owns a domain name and to have a delegation for the person who comes for the certificate. So a lot more checks. These extended validation certificates have introduced a minimum threshold of validation that is strong enough that we can be quite confident in it. For the, CA, for the simulated CA to <laughs> sign our certificate, you just need to run this script. It is in your home directory of the secapdev user in the subdirectory CA. You call that script and you give it as parameter the certificate signing request that you have just created. And it should produce a certificate called CA signed and put it in that, into that path. And I'll try to run it from here. That's something, that's something else. Okay, in case you still need those. <coughs> Voila. First, the script will ask you for your password for elevating privileges, so it, so it can start touching those important files. <clears throat> and the second thing it will ask you is the, the passphrase that protects the private key of the fake CA, of the simulated CA we have there. 
The password for that key is trusted CA. In one word, all small. Trusted CA. I hope that real CAs don't have only that level of protection on there. In fact, I've worked for a company that had also had a CA business. And it would, uh, I was talking to the people who were developing the software they used for doing all the signing. And they were indeed working with hardware, security modules, stuff which will generate the key pair, and it, it will give you the public key. It will export the public key so you can use it, but it will never, there's no API for getting the private key out legitimately. You have to try physical hacks, emanations, to deduce what the private key might be. The hardware security module will sign stuff for you, but it will not give you the key. You have to give it the certificate, and it will, sorry, you have to give it the request, and it will give you the certificate, and that kind of thing. Now, here you can see, let's see, what's interesting here? I suppose the common name from here is interesting, and also the fact that we are creating a website certificate, and also the fact that we're going to have all those domain names there for which the certificate will work. Trusted CA. I'll write it here. Now we have in a place on the hard disk prepared for Apache to use them certificates signed by a certification authority that's trusted by the browser. The last thing we need to do is to tell Apache to use the new certificate and the new key. And then to reload, we might need to restart Apache, we might need to restart Firefox in case it's caching the certificates, and, um, and then it should work. Yes, exactly. This is it. Have you got it? That script exists. The CA sign script exists. <laughs> so with this command up there in the top right corner, I'm editing the file to tell Apache to look at the new certificate. And I'm scrolling down until I find again those directive uh, SSL certificate file. Here we go. <coughs> I've chosen VI. I don't know if you know VI. You, yeah. It's a bit weird with editing modes and how you delete stuff and how you add stuff. Here. So now in the configuration file, we're, we've told Apache to use our new keys and certificate, but Apache is still running. <coughs> Apache is still running and hasn't updated itself yet. step of act one should work. For me, it worked. 
Anyone else got that far? Yeah. Good, good, good. It will, we, we have to conclude this session f because of time. If you'd be so kind as to go to a neighbor who hasn't gotten as far yet and make sure they also manage to see, manage to see it work before we adjourn for the day. <laughs>